piecewise functions, and continuity. All right, so <clears throat> they actually give you a type of piecewise function at the top where it says um, USPS rates for first class stamps. This is what's called a step function, obviously. Why it's called a step function, hopefully, is clear in that top left corner. But types of piecewise functions that you'll see in like real life, a step function is one of it, also called a greatest integer, is something that doesn't gradually change. So like a parabola or something gradually changes, a linear equation gradually changes, but something like the cost of a stamp does not. It's not continuous. It's a legit step function. And I don't know how far back this goes. What's 2003? So they were like, I don't know, what does my, oh, those are only 10 cents increments. So what, they were like 35 cents, okay? It's not like they go 35 cents, 35.1, 35.2, 35.1. They don't. They're like, they're 35 cents, and we're going to have a rate increase. Now they're 37 cents. And then we're going to have a rate increase. Now they're 40 cents, okay? And so it's this it's significant jump. Like, you can think of it, too, for, like, um, minimum wage. Minimum wage is this price, and then it's going to go up by, you know, 15 cents or whatever, and then it's going to jump. So it's not like a, a slope that happens. It's, a, it's an actual step. Um, they do it when they charge different rates. So let's say you rent a car, and they'll say you have so many miles or any portion of the mile. So you have 40 miles. You don't have 40.2 miles that they charge you for or 40.3 miles. Any portion of that is gonna be considered 41 miles. Does that make sense? And so that's another type of step function. Um, <clears throat> but these are all pieces. And so a piecewise function is when you have pieces of different functions that get put together. Like this step function would be y equals uh, three, y equals four, y equals five, right? That's a step function. Another type of piecewise function is where they do something like this. Absolute value is an example of a piecewise function. And it looks like it when you graph it. Absolute value looks like a linear equation going down. And then you get to this point and it changes completely and now you have a linear equation going up. Why? Well, think about when you're solving absolute value equations. You set up two equations, right? When we learned long ago to solve absolute values, you would set it equal to the positive and set it equal to the negative, and you would legit solve two equations to figure out what it was, right? That's a type of piecewise function. So it could be something like a step function where it's like greatest integer, hey, the closest to the value, or it could be something like an absolute value function. And we're gonna get into a couple other different types where they actually define it differently. But you'll see with piecewise function that when you graph it, you can legitimately see that it is pieces of different functions put together, which is why it's called a piecewise function. The first thing they do is they give us an absolute value function and they want us to graph it. <clears throat> and I don't know if they actually ask us to graph it, but they do graph it for us for, well, on the next one they do. So absolute value is very simple. They want us to... Um, Evaluate the function at these specific members of the domain. Now, obviously, the domain for this is from negative infinity to positive infinity. This is a continuous function, right? There's no problems in this absolute value. It turns a corner, right? But you can still put any number in there. But they specifically want that. So anytime you see the word evaluate, and we're not going to spend a ton of time here because I actually know that, hopefully know that you know how to do this, but we're going to do one example. Anytime you see the word evaluate, they legit want you to plug it in and solve. All right, that, that's what evaluate means. So don't let the word evaluate throw you. Evaluate means plug it in and solve. They have given you X values here. Anytime you're given an X, you can solve for Y by simply plugging it in and solving. So if I were gonna do this, I would say, well, G of negative four. That means I'm going to take this absolute value, plug in a negative four and solve, right? Remember absolute value, solve the inside first, two times negative four which is negative eight minus three, which is negative 11, but we are talking absolute value. So I have positive 11. What does this tell me? This tells me that on a graph, my x, y value would be x of negative four, y of positive 11. And I would graph that on a coordinate plane, just like that. Okay, evaluate. I would do that for all of them. If I jump to like positive two here, g of positive two, two times positive two minus three. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 3 is 1. We're talking about absolute value. Absolute value is just 1. Again, what does that tell me? Well, on this particular graph, I would have that x, y value. Okay? 
So this is all Evaluate is telling us to do, whether it's a piecewise function or not. Now, what's important with something like an absolute value is that if you do not know what it looks like, you could potentially pick numbers that would make you think you're just graphing a line, right? Does that make sense? So if you don't pick enough values or you don't remember what an absolute value function looks like, then you could not have enough information and draw just a linear graph. And that would be an incorrect graph of an absolute value, okay? So we're gonna start talking about parent functions and things like that. And the reason you need to know parent function is because there are some legit basic functions that if you can get an image in your head of what the parent function looks like, then the other guys, the transformations will come very simply. All right, and so we're gonna talk about several parent functions in the next sections or so. And this is one of them. Absolute values is a type of piecewise function because it turns, okay, it turns. Even if you picked certain values and you maybe couldn't tell that it's going to turn, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so I want you, I don't, I didn't give us enough room here, hang on. Do one evaluation. <clears throat> Um, evaluating <clears throat> a function that is a greatest integer. This is called greatest integer function. Um, you'll see the notation. It actually looks like a matrix notation. And sometimes you'll actually see it without the top cuff, um, if that you understand. So it, sometimes you'll see it with just the base on it and not the top folded over, okay? Do not mistake this for an absolute value. All right, absolute value are the sticks with no tops or bottoms, right? Um, greatest integer looks like this. What does greatest integer mean? Um, it means the greatest integer closest to that particular number. So for negative two, it's gonna be negative two inclusive up to negative one. All right, so what does this look like in step function? If I am at negative two, which is right here, all right, then my y value is always gonna be negative two all the way up to negative one. All right, and then at negative one, I'm gonna be negative one all the way up to zero. And you can do a bottom cap of these or a top cap of these. So uh, in a word problem, it will say any portion thereof, right? So that means you're always gonna round up no matter what your decimal place is. And the example I gave you with um, traveling and you rent a car, if they charge per mile, right? Then they will often say, per mile or any portion thereof. So if you travel 40.2 miles, math would naturally tell you to round down. Any portion thereof is greatest integer, meaning it's gonna automatically be 41 as soon as you get over a 40 mark. So you're gonna say 39, 39, you're gonna get charged right here up to 39, 39.1, you're gonna jump and get charged for 40, okay? And you're going to get charged for 40 all the way up to 40, equaling 40. And then right above 40, you're going to jump to the 41 mark. That's a top, right? That's doing greatest integer on the high end. Or you can do it on the low end. Maybe they always round down. I don't know when they ever do that. But, you know, um, it's going to be including and up to, and then it's going to jump at the end, which is what it did here. So it could be like a price change. Your stamps cost this for this period of time. And then exactly at this period of time, it jumps to a new price, okay? And so those are the times when you're gonna see these, but I want you to recognize the notation because they typically won't make you graph them, but they will ask you which graphs match, right? And so that's a very fun standardized question, is which of these graphs goes with these functions? And I want you to recognize that notation is always going to be a step function, okay? That is a greatest integer, it will always be a step function, okay? 
and then they will define it somehow. And they may define it in a word problem and then show you the function notation, or they may just show you the function notation to see if you recognize that it's going to be a step function. Parent functions are vitally important when you start talking about piecewise functions, all right? Because hopefully up to this point, if I were to say mx plus b, your brain should immediately think line. It should. If you see y equals 2x plus 1, your brain should think that is a line, okay? If you say y equals absolute value of x, your brain should automatically think v. And if I say y equals x squared plus or minus anything, you should think parabola, okay? And with a piecewise function, they can put any functions together in pieces. And what they typically do is they give you a function and then they define the domain. It is an explicit domain for that piece of the function. By explicit, I mean they are telling you exactly the x values for which that piece of the function is represented. And then they go to another completely different function and they say, okay, now for these x values, I want you to use this one. And then for these x values, I want you to use this one. And that's a piecewise function. And that's what they've done here. And so if you look, we have a parabola, right? We have an absolute value, which is a V, and we have a linear function with a negative slope, okay? And so when I draw this or sketch this out, I can pick numbers to see where on the graph I am, but in my mind, I should be thinking parabola, V, and line, okay? Because that's basically what my piecewise is going to come out to. And so the first thing they did is they picked some numbers for the parabola piece. The numbers are based on the domain. The domain of the parabola is anything less than or equal to negative one, which means I could pick negative one, which they did, and then I pick something below negative one or two or three things below negative one if I wanna get an idea of what's going on, all right? Now, <clears throat> if you know parabola as well, this is the parent function of a parabola, which means the vertex is at zero, zero, and it goes up, okay? So if I'm at negative one, I am on the left side of that sloping parabola, right? And so visually in my brain, I'm thinking I have a parabola sitting at zero and I'm doing everything negative one over. So I should have this little curve coming down, right? Then they move on to the absolute value. We have just absolute value of X. Once again, this is the parent function, correct? Meaning it is a, it is a V directly sitting on my zero, zero, all right? which means once I stop with the parabola, I'm gonna take a sharp linear, okay? A sharp linear going towards zero, zero. And after zero, I'm gonna take a sharp linear going up, right? This is a perfect V, all right? And this goes all the way from negative one to positive two, which means I am gonna cross that V, am I not? Does that make sense? So they have chosen, it is inclusive of two, but not inclusive of negative one. So you'll notice they chose negative one. Now, why did they choose that? It's not part of my problem. Well, they want to see if it jumps, okay? So even though technically negative one is still part of the function before it, they want to see if those two are the same thing because with piecewise functions, you could legit come down that parabola and jump over to the V. It doesn't necessarily have to keep going. All right, it is a piecewise function. The step function didn't keep going, it jumped, did it not? And so the reason you plug in those overlap numbers, even though they're only part of one or the other, is you want to see if they are the same number, if I'm gonna continue. And you'll notice it did. When I plug in the negative one where it belongs in the parabola piece, it also equals the same thing when I plug it into the absolute value piece. This tells me I am going to keep going. So I'm gonna curve with the parabola, but I'm not gonna pick that pencil up. I'm not gonna jump over and start at a new spot. Does that make sense? All right, and so I'm gonna keep going with my V. And then they chose zero and two, which were both included in my domain, right? And then we're on to the linear function piece. This is a linear function with a negative slope, right? So now I've come down and then I'm gonna have a negative slope here. All right, and this is everything bigger than two. So now I am larger than two, and I'm gonna have this negative slope, all right, of a linear equation. You'll notice that two was included in my absolute value, but two was not part of my domain, and it's just greater than here. But they still plugged it in, 
Why? Well, here, my y value is two. Here, my y value is three. I jump, okay? Which means I pick up my pencil and I go to three and I put this open circle. Why do I put an open circle? The same reason I put an open circle on a number line. I am indicating where I'm starting from, but I'm also indicating I don't technically include that three, okay? And then from there, I'm gonna travel down because as I get to five, I'm all the way to zero and I'm gonna go on infinitely from there. All right. And so hopefully you have got this picture in your brain of what's going on. We have a parabola to a V jump and then to a line. All right. And if you see, that is what happens. All right. And they've shaded it beautifully, right? We have the parabola piece. Here we go. We're coming down. It connects to my absolute value piece, absolute value all the way up until where I stop, closed circle on the absolute value, right? Because it includes that two. And then we jump. We jump to three. We have an open circle at three because it does not include it. And we go down from there. All right, and they start with left hands. All right, left hand limits, right hand limits, and definition of limits. So let's start with the definition of limit first. <clears throat> Basically, the, the overall limit is saying they have to approach the same thing from the left and the right. So then what do they mean by approaching? And I always refer to this if you were traveling along the line, okay? So they are telling you what X is doing with your limit question. So for this question, they are telling you, without a doubt, that x is going towards a. And they will say, the limit as x approaches a. The limit as x approaches a. And, and notation-wise, it looks like this. Limit as x approaches a of some function. And they'll give you the function, OK? Now here's what I'm not asking for. It does not say evaluate the function at A, okay? So like in a piecewise function, you could jump, right? And so evaluating it may mean different things depending on where in the function you are. Or you could have a hole in the function. We talked about this last year, right? A removable discontinuity creates this hole. And so then you could say, I cannot evaluate it at A because at A I have a hole, right? And so limit does not necessarily mean what is the function at. It means what is the function doing as you get close to, okay? And so you're always given your x, and when they ask for limit, they want to know what y is doing. I relate it to a roller coaster. In a roller coaster, this part would be the ground, right? And this would be the guy that you are riding. So far, so good. The ground is your horizontal movement, okay? So they're telling you what your horizontal movement is. Your horizontal movement is moving towards A. They want to know what the roller coaster is doing as the horizontal movement goes towards A, okay? And so if I were to ask this, I would say, okay, well, um, on the left-hand side, just like what it means, visually from the left or numerically from the negative side, okay? On the roller coaster from the left-hand side, I am coming up the roller coaster, and then I'm coming back down the roller coaster, and then I'm coming right here. And I'm approaching this number on that roller coaster, okay? From the left-hand side. From the right-hand side, I'm way up here, and I'm coming down, and I happen to be actually approaching the same number from the right-hand side. I do not want you to give me A. I told you A. I want to know what this roller coaster is approaching right here, which is my Y value, okay? Now, here's the thing. In order to have an overall limit, you have to be approaching the same thing, all right? If we have two trains coming these directions and they're approaching two different things, they're on two different tracks. And this guy's going over here and this guy's going over here. And we do not have an overall limit if they're not approaching the same thing, okay? So from the left-hand side, you could say, I'm approaching two. And from the right-hand side, you could say, I'm approaching three. You can have a left-hand limit, sorry, on your perspective, a left-hand limit and a right-hand limit, okay? But if they are not the same thing, your overall limit does not exist. 
If they are the same thing, it means they're approaching the same thing. So just like with our piecewise function, the reason I put in my border numbers is I wanted to see if they were approaching the same thing to see if it was a continuous function, if it was going to keep going, okay? Or if I was going to jump and move at a different point forward, okay? And so limit just is asking, what is Y doing as your horizontal movement is getting close to a specific X that I gave you? What is Y doing? All right, so let's look at what happens when it jumps and different types of discontinuities that you can have. The first type is called a jump discontinuity. These are typically happen with a piecewise function. So if I were to guess what happened with this piecewise function, I would guess that this was a linear or potentially an absolute value, right? But this is some type of linear and then my domain changed and I jumped to a, a parabola pointing down, okay? And they did not meet in the middle. This is a jump discontinuity. Discontinuity just means it does not continue like your normal roller coaster would continue, okay? One type is a jump. You're trucking along, you stop, you jump to a new point and you start over. Jump discontinuity. They're visually easy to see. Um, functionality wise, they're typically a piece wise where your endpoints don't meet, like that first example that we did. The next one is called an infinite discontinuity, all right? These are removable, non-removable discontinuities that create an asymptote. Anytime you have a non-removable discontinuity, the denominator doesn't cancel out if you factor it, okay? And there's a zero down there. You are gonna go infinitely in one direction because you're gonna get super close to it, never touch it. Infinite discontinuity. You can have this point discontinuity, two types of point discontinuity. The first type is like we would have done last year. Factor, cancel out, it creates a hole, okay? So it looks like a normal graph, except there is a hole, okay? That can happen. Or you can have that same exact thing, and it's a piecewise function, meaning it has a function with a problem, and they're going to say it's defined everywhere except the problem, just like this, and you create this weird function with a hole, and then it also defines it at the hole. And they'll say, well, when you get to this point, this is two, right? When you actually get to two, the function is going to be four there. And they literally hand you what the XY value is for that discontinuity, okay? Those are both considered point discontinuities. At just this one little single point, you track along, you jump over the point, and you keep going. It's still discontinuous. Now you'll notice the function is defined everywhere right here, right? It's defined all the way here, it's defined here, but it is still not continuous, all right? Still not continuous. Here, it is not defined everywhere, right? We actually have an X value that it is not defined at all at. Here, it is not defined everywhere, but we still have a problem because we have a hole. Here, it is defined everywhere. We still have a problem because where we have the hole is to find a different number, okay? So these are your types of discontinuity. A function is continuous at A. If it is defined at A, F of A, F of A exists, so you can actually have a number at that point, and the limit is also the same at that number. You'll notice none of these happen. This function is defined at two right here. Everybody see that? But my limit at two doesn't exist. Because left and right go to two different things. Here, it doesn't meet the first qualification. My function is not defined at two. You can see that at two, we get infinitely close, but we don't actually ever define at two. Doesn't meet the first one, right? It's not defined at two, we have a hole. This one meets the first one. It is defined at two. At two, it is four. F of, F, F of X is defined at two, right? But the limit at two is down here. The limit at two is actually going to be two. Those are two different things, also discontinuous. In order for it to be continuous, it has to be defined at that point, and the limit as you're getting close to that point also has to be the same number. That is the technical definition of continuous. And you can see continuous. Continuous is easy to see. Definition is more detailed. All right, so let's look at these. Are they continuous at these points? If they are not, what type of discontinuity do we have? So anything, anytime I have a function like this, the first thing I'm gonna do is, is um, factor it if possible, all right? 